All right. So when it comes to applying for, for the PhD, um, we'll kind of start with, with why you might want one. Um, you know, so PhDs are a research degree, right? And one way to think about them is you spend a couple of years getting your master's degree, and then you go on to do three to four more years worth of writing a dissertation where you have to go forth and create uh, original knowledge, right? Um, and so you're being trained to be a researcher. That's that's sort of what the degree is for. And so, I mean, those three letters at the end of your name are nice no matter what field you're in. Um, you know, my my co-parent um, has a PhD in literature and that PhD was helpful. Uh, you know, she then went to law school and the, but the PhD helped her get a sort of a prestigious federal clerkship, um, even though, you know, a PhD in literature isn't directly, you know, she wasn't doing literature research for, uh, uh, or literature scholarship for, for the judge that she worked for. Um, so they can be useful in a variety of domains, but mostly you're getting a PhD because you want to be an analyst or a researcher in government, in finance, in tech, for an NGO, but you want to be in a research position um, or at a think tank, or the main reason, probably most people who are getting PhDs are planning to head into the academy, right? That they're planning to either be a professor at a research university, right? Which is where you'll have, if you're at a research university, you'll teach between two and five classes a year. Usually three or four is kind of the standard number in the social sciences. So you'll teach three or four classes a year and spend half of your time uh, doing research. So you're kind of like ha roughly half teaching, half research is kind of fairly standard for social sciences. Um, and then there's teaching faculty positions where like if you're Cal State faculty in political science, you'll teach eight classes a year as opposed to like, you know, I teach three here at USC, Cal State faculty teach eight. Sometimes you're teaching multiple sections of the same thing. So it's not, not like you're teaching eight unique classes always, but the teaching load is a lot uh, heavier, um, but then the research expectations are, are somewhat lower um, and sometimes non-existent depending on like if you're a, at a community college, they may not care whether you do research at all, um, you're strictly strictly teaching. So PhDs are great for jobs in universities. So those are kind of like the, when would you get a PhD as opposed to a master's? It's mostly if you're doing research or working at a university. Um, what the PhD kind of program is, uh, the first couple of years are, you know, you got, in order to get into a PhD program, people are very good undergraduate students, right? And the first two years is not, radically unlike something you've known before. You're gonna take some research methods, training courses, so some stats courses, research design, maybe game theory, maybe a course on like ethnographic or archival research methods, right? Depending on your field. Um, but, but you'll be trained with kind of the nuts and bolts of how to do it. And then you'll be in these seminars where you read papers and think deep thoughts, right? So like I'm teaching the International Political Economy Field Seminar uh, this spring in our PhD program here. And every week we will read six papers um, that are kind of recent journal, uh, recent papers in top journals or classic articles in the field. We'll talk about those articles and sort of what's good about them and what's bad about them and what's the next paper that needs to be written in this in this uh, area. And so it's getting to know the research frontier uh, and the substantive uh, kind of content of your field. Um, so that's what you do for your first two years. And at the end of those two years, you take your qualifying exams and you hand in a second year paper, which is like your kind of big inter independent research paper. That big independent research paper is smaller than, but a little bit like a master's thesis. And your qualifying exams uh, allow your department to certify that you have mastery of this field and are prepared to teach in it, right? So you'll take these big exams. Um, and at that point, you get a master's degree. If you pass your qualifying exams and, and defend your second year paper successfully, you get a master's degree, right? Uh, and then you head on to the remainder of your PhD program, kind of years three through six or seven, or but usually three through six, um, where in the third year, you're writing what's called a prospectus, which is your plan for the dissertation. It also kind of works out as like a contract between you and your dissertation committee. You're saying, this is my plan for the for the dissertation. And they're kind of signing off that like, yeah, if you execute on that, we'll give you a PhD at the end. Um, this is the hardest thing uh, in a PhD program is to step away from, okay, I took a bunch of classes. I've mastered a bunch of content. Now I'm going to make a plan to go forth and create new and valuable knowledge in the field. That's stepping out of what you've always done as a student to do something totally new and different. And, and that's hard, 
And I would say the third year of the PhD program is the hardest year in a PhD program because a lot of students kind of flounder and, and don't struggle to take that, that next step to becoming a producer of knowledge. And then the, the last couple of years of your dissertation, uh, of your PhD program are really loosely structured. And your job is to finish your dissertation. And it's also to um, work on some side project papers that work toward getting you something published. Um, for folks who are trying to land a job as a tenure track uh, research professor, right? You're trying to get that first tenure track job. Usually that requires having something already published. Um, it's very hard to get a tenure track job offer without something already accepted. So starting around your second or third year, you're working on one or two or three side projects um, that are papers outside of your dissertation. Often they're collaborative with other people, but you'll be submitting for publication before you're done with the PhD with the hopes that at least one of those is accepted for publication before you're on the job market um, for the folks who are doing that uh, kind of academic uh, uh, job market track. Okay, so We've done kind of why you might want one and kind of what, what the PhD, getting the PhD is like. Um, can you afford to do it, right? What, what, is, what are the finances here? So on one level, PhDs are free, right? You're not, your tuition is going to be paid by the department, not by you. So like um, there are PhD programs out there that you have to pay for, but not very many of them. They're kind of the lower ranked programs. If you get into a good PhD program, it will be fully funded. Um, so master's degrees are expensive, but they are easier to get into. Um, you do get a master's degree on your way to a PhD. So there were a number of students in my uh, cohort in grad school where they hit year three. And either by the time they got to the end of their quals, they were like, yeah, I already know this is not for me. And they exited right at the end of their second year. Or they got into their third year and were kind of really struggling with the prospectus. And we're like, you know what? I'm out of here. And so folks, you know, quit the program after after two or two and a half years, and they exited with a free master's degree, and they went to very successful careers in D.C. and in other places, right? So quit it. I mean, I think, like, maybe culturally, we sort of put a really bad rap on quitting, but quitting a PhD program after two years is a really sane thing to do in many, many cases, <laughs> and, and you just got a master's degree you did not pay, uh, uh, you did not pay for. Um, obviously, like, Universities are making a huge investment. When we admit a PhD student, that's a commitment of like $300,000, $350,000 that it's going to cost us to train that person. Um, and so when that person, you know, when we burn one hundred and fifty grand on that person and then they bounce, like that sucks for the department. But you know what? That's the department's problem, not yours. So you should not feel guilty if you get into a PhD program, decide two years later that, you know what? I'm going to take my master's degree and run. That is a totally sane choice to make. Um, while you're in the PhD, you'll make between 25 and 45 K a year. There are probably some departments out there where it's under 25. Um, but I'd say most social science PhD programs that I'm aware of the, the stipends using that. And mostly it's the 25 to 35 range right now. Like Princeton, I think pays like 44. Um, there's a few places that pay more. Um, so you're probably like in the low thirties, right? And if you're like trying to live in a, you're going to have roommates in Koreatown, like if you're at USC, you know, you're going to. That's an apartment with roommates and, and scrimping on the food. Like it's not, you're not living high on the hog, but you have good, uh, you have good health insurance with that. Um, it's actually, it's not good health insurance for kids. Uh, but my eldest son was on uh, uh, Medi-Cal when he was born um, because <laughs> I was still a grad student and my health insurance was not going to cover him. Uh, but I qualified for uh, Medi-Cal because, you know, um, grad students also paid that well. Um, so a lot like at the USC PhD program in your first year, um, you're on fellowship and you don't have to work and you're just taking classes. Years like two to um, years two through five, uh, you're working as a teaching assistant or a research assistant. And then in we also are able to at USC offer a sixth year fellowship, like a final year fellowship. So you like your first and your last year, you don't have to teach or uh, teach or be somebody else's research assistant and in all the middle years you do. Um, so different programs have different um, different ways that you're kind of earning that that stipend every year. Um, all right, and and you know we can talk about it more. But what you really want to be doing is you want to be working as a research assistant, not a teaching assistant. Um, like TAing for a semester is fine or a year, uh, but you don't want to do it more than that because what you want is to be the nice thing about a research working as a research assistant is that 
if it goes well, you can end up the co as a co-author on a paper, right? And so you can sort of getting paid to work on research that also goes on your CV. And that's what you really want because you're, if you're heading for tenure track academia, what you need to do is publish, 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 and getting, and so instead of grading papers, if you're working on something publishable, that's a big, uh, a big advantage. Um, okay. So if you're in the social sciences, you're like, well, should I get a political science PhD or an econ PhD or, or, or what should I, what should I do? Um, sociology PhD, different things. Um, within the social sciences, like econ, econ is, is, is the queen bee, right? Where these programs are the hardest to get into. Um, the financial returns outside of academia are probably higher uh, for econ PhDs uh, than for other social science PhDs. Um, and I'd say within social, any social science PhD, like if you're, if you get a PhD in political science and you're doing a bunch of quant stuff and you have strong statistical toolkit, then really high paid private sector things are fairly easy to get. Um, if you're a qualitative scholar, you can also, it, I know a number of people with, uh, sort of who are qualitative researchers, sociologists or political scientists or otherwise who also exited successfully into high paid uh, private sector research gigs, but I'd say the quant skills are, are particularly in demand. Um, so econ, it's going to be very hard to get into. And like, you know, they, they sort of, one of the sort of examples given in measurement theory about how we have no idea really what the relationship is between math GRE score and success in a, in a top econ PhD program, because we have no variation in the independent variable. Uh, unless you have, you know, a perfect or just off of perfect math GRE score, you're not going to get into a, a top econ PhD program. So we just, we have no idea whether it's predictive or not, because everybody has the same math GRE score. They all have perfect or near perfect. Um, so that's kind of the deal with getting into econ PhD programs. And your math GRE matters a ton. And there's huge uh, international competition for especially those top departments. Um, you get outside of the top 10 departments and the competition's a little bit less fierce, but it's still very fierce. Um, political science, public policy, sociology, not easy to get into, but easier than econ. Um, and I would say the public policy job market for like tenure track is always pretty good, right? Um, you're going to be teaching, if you get a PhD in public policy and go to a public policy school, more of your teaching will probably be master's students than undergrads. If you're in a political science department, you're teaching uh, pre-law students. Um, like <laughs> So... Undergraduates who intend to go to law school pay the bills in political science departments. Uh, master's students pay the, pay the bills in uh, public policy departments. And sociology is trying to figure out how to pay the bills. Um, you know, they have less of a little bit of like, I mean, I guess a lot of pre-law majors also probably pay the bills in sociology. Um, as far as, you know, you can ask a lot of the same research questions across any of these, right? You could, Depending on your research topic, you could get a PhD in any of these fields and, and tackle it. Um, data science PhDs are relatively new. Um, I have a couple of different students who are uh, former students who are getting them right now, who are in those programs right now. Actually, one has just finished uh, a data science PhD program. Very good private sector options. And I think pretty good options in the academy um, because a lot of universities are trying to like kind of staff up in these areas and there's huge demand for undergraduate and master's courses in this area. So my sense is that the job market is pretty good in the academy as well, but I know a little bit less about that academic job market. Um, and then stats PhDs, um, kind of similarly, uh, probably similar, you know, their stats departments tend to be smaller than econ departments, um, but that's, you know, that's a degree obviously that has tremendous uh, exit options into the private sector, which then keeps the academic market healthier, right? Because if a lot of your faculty are getting recruited out to private sector jobs, that creates new faculty openings. Um, so yeah, okay. Um, what I will say is like, the reason I was told to go get a political science PhD instead of an econ PhD is that I could do more substantively focused work earlier without needing to be as focused on innovating in methodological ways, whereas econ is going to really want to see some methodological innovation early in your career before you kind of like get to take swings at big substantive questions. I think that's probably a little bit unfair. Um, all the advice I was getting was from political scientists, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but there's definitely, I think economists are a little more happy with 
really technically sophisticated, precise answers to unimportant questions. Uh, and political science is a little more willing to tolerate uh, somewhat imprecise or poor answers to interesting questions. Um, and I would actually, if there's kind of a scale here, I'd put econ on one end and sociology on the other and political science and public policy in the middle um, of kind of how much we're, hey, does this really matter in the world as opposed to can we answer this really well and really precisely? Um, but, you know, you talk to people in different fields and you kind of get read papers in different fields and say, OK, when people are writing about the research area I care about, which of these sorts of approaches feels more like the type of work I want to do. Um, once you've decided what field you want to apply to or, hey, I want to apply to PhD programs in two different fields and see what I get into. Also reasonable. Um, like, how do you decide which programs to apply to, like which universities to apply to? Um, particularly if you want to go into tenure track academia, prestige matters a lot. Um, it matters less, going, it matters always, but it doesn't matter nearly as much if you're going into the private sector, but it matters a tremendous amount um, within the academy. So it's very much like apply to the top 10 departments and see which ones you get into uh, kind of a thing. If you're heading private sector, you know, like there's a lot more, I think, space uh, around that. Um, you do want to get into more than one PhD program. So you want to cast a wide net because what they'll do is they admit you, but they admit you with a particular funding offer. And uh, and those funding offers are negotiable, where if you get in and your annual stipend they're offering you is $32,000 a year, but you also got into this other university that's offering you $36,000 a year, and you'd like to go to the first university, well, you say, hey, you know, University B is offering you $36,000 a year. Can you raise my offer to 36? Uh, and, and they will fairly often do that. You know, so we will give top ups to the students we're really trying to recruit from other programs. So having that second admission uh, can be worth a lot of money to you. Um, so you want to get into more than one program so you can negotiate your offer. Um, fee waivers are sometimes possible, right? When you think about when I'm saying like, hey, go apply to 10 programs um, and there's a hundred dollar application fee associated with every single one. You're like, oh man, that's a thousand bucks. Um, sometimes you can get uh, fee waivers for student for financial hardship. So you can say essentially like I'm broke. Uh, I can't afford that. And they will waive the fee. Um, but you have to ask them like a couple months ahead of the deadline usually to, to get that fee waiver uh, through. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, looking at it program by program for fee waivers. Um, and, and a lot of the reason why you're applying to 10 programs is that the admissions process is super noisy. Uh, undergrad, law school, med school, the people who do application, who do admissions at those places are admissions professionals. Right, that's their job. And so it's somewhat systematic, it's a little bit more predictable. Uh, when we do admissions to the PhD program, it's like which three or four faculty members are on the PhD admissions committee that, that year, right? And then they will read the files and they will do it badly and they will apply their own really weird and idiosyncratic uh, uh, sort of set of criteria. And so whether you get into the Harvard PhD program this year or not, it's really going to depend like who's sitting on that admissions committee this year. Did they think your topic was interesting? Did that, you know, like what are the criteria they're applying? It's going to vary a lot. And so we have significant, you know, like I, I'm still bitter about this uh, where like we have a student who got into Berkeley, which is a much better PhD program than our program here at USC, or at least somewhat better. And we did not admit that student here at USC. Still very angry about, um, and it was I mean, I was going to tell that student to go to Berkeley anyway, but I'm just like, really, really? Like <laughs> somehow they couldn't get it, you know? So we, we, there are weird patterns that way where you will have students who get rejected at the 25th ranked university and get into the third ranked university, right? That's just not uncommon. So, you know, you, you apply to 10 in part because it's so noisy. Um, okay. And I mean, do more than 10, God bless you if you have that kind of st stamina and, and whatever, you know, but I, I think 10 is maybe kind of a balance between not going crazy and also casting a fairly wide net. Um, so if you're like, you know, so you apply to some, some reach schools, some schools you think are about the right tier and some sort of a couple of like more toward the safety side. Um, most of those deadlines, I think, are kind of between de December 1 and January 1. Um, there might be a couple in late November, but I'm pretty sure mostly their December one is kind of the early ones. And I'll talk through each of these, but your application packet is usually your CV, which is a lot like a resume. Um, 
They'll ask, some will ask for a personal statement and a research statement. Some will ask for a combined statement. They ask for different flavors, but there's some combination of personal and research statement that they're asking for. It's so usually three letters of recommendation. You'll submit your GRE scores. These are optional now at some departments, but but required by some and, and probably will help you. Um, you submit your transcripts, which are always a pain to get, so you start requesting those early. Um, and then you submit a writing sample. Um, so that's usually what the packet looks like. Um, we can talk about what each of those are. When you're doing your CV, right, what's, I mean, it's great if you have publications, like, but the expectation is like, as an undergrad, you probably don't. So if you have, you know, we, we occasionally we're able to have spec undergrads who, who get a peer reviewed publication or folks who have written like editor reviewed things sort of like for an undergraduate journal or something like that. So definitely highlight your publications if you have them. That would be, it. should put it on the slide is that's the most important thing is publications if you got them, but the expectation is most people don't. So then we're looking for what research experience do you have as like somebody's research assistant or something and try to be kind of specific about the stuff that you did. You know, were you just doing data entry or were you doing something more interesting? And to the extent you were doing something more interesting and challenging, highlight that. Um, and, you know, and highlight sort of any, uh, anything on the technical skill side, the language skill side, um, stuff like that. You're really trying to, what are any of the things in your professional background? Cause you're kind of listing, you know, like past jobs you've had and stuff like this, but you're really trying to say, I am going to be excellent at research. Here's how you should know I'm going to be excellent at research. Um, so that's really the drive on the resume is any evidence you've got of, of research excellence. Um, on those, the personal statement, the research statement, um, a lot of what's going on in that research statement is you're kind of learning, does this person like understand what academic sociology is or what academic political science is? Do they understand what the field is, how it's organized and what makes a compelling or coherent set of like research interests or research questions? That's a lot of what I get out of those statements. Um, I got into graduate school without understanding that, but that was a long time ago and I couldn't have gotten it. I couldn't get into a top 10 PhD program today. Um, uh, you know, and yeah, it, it gets harder every, every year. So I think you need to know kind of how the field's organized and be able to articulate something that makes sense as a plausible set of research interests. Um, if you say you're interested, that if you give a set of research interests that are essentially not publishable in the field that are not the kind of things that people study these days, uh, it's not going to help you get in, right? Do let folks know where you come from, right? There's, I think there's a kind of bring your whole self to your career kind of moment that we're in for, again, all this is, so one thing I'll say is this process is noisy. It's a random faculty member who's reading your statement. And if you ask 10 different faculty members, what makes a good personal statement, you're going to get 10 different answers. So some of this is like, write the statement that like seems compelling to you and, you know, and, and hope you get the right draw from the distribution uh, on who's sitting on the, the committee that year. But let folks know where you come from. Let them know what your background is, particularly if you come from a background that isn't super well represented in, in the academy, right? Like, um, make your personal statement a lot about your research interests. If your parents are professors and you went to a private high school and elite undergraduate university, like that's that's kind of the archetype for the kids that apply to PhD programs and get this, right? If you are not that background, right? If you are not a professor's kid from a wealthy suburb, um, you know, tell them that. Um, okay. Letters of rec. Probably these are coming from three of your undergrad professors, um, or if you've gotten a master's degree before the PhD, then then um, from from professors in your master's program. Um, it can be, you know, if you've done, you know, if you had a research gig at a think tank or at a, or an analyst at a firm or something like that where you were doing research, get a work supervisor uh, uh, a letter. The the thing about professors is that they tend to know how to play the game. Not all professors do, but part of writing a good letter is in the same way I'm kind of starting to coach you guys how to play the game of applying. There's a game for how to write an effective letter of recommendation. You want a, a recommender who knows the game that they're playing. Um, so somebody who is like your boss at a firm who's who never went through a PhD and didn't sort of hasn't been on this side of things may not kind of know how to play it, uh, may not know how to write you a letter that the committee is going to find compelling. 
Um, you need somebody who's going to be willing to invest time in your letter. Um, I will share with you guys my letter of rec request guide if you don't already have it, which is a way for you to kind of tee up your letter writer so that the time they do invest, they can use really effectively. Um, but you, you need somebody who's willing to spend time on a good letter, um, who knows you well enough to do it. All else equal, it's great if you can have somebody prestigious write your letter, right? Um, somebody who's uh, a full professor or an endowed chair at a prestigious university, like that's any of those sort of things. Um, if it is a name that the people on the committee recognize, that helps. Now, a, a mediocre letter from a famous person is worse than a good letter from a junior scholar I've never heard of, like if I'm sitting on the committee. But academia can be many things at once. It is sometimes a fairly decently operating meritocracy, and sometimes it is a, um, it is a clientelist system, right? And there is an element to... Uh, if I, you know, I write letters for my spec students and if somebody admits one of my spec students into their grad program, they're like, oh, I saw the application of your spec student. They look so great. We're admitting them, right? That's both like sharing good news and it's also letting me know that I owe them a favor, right? Like this is also like, this is at the end also kind of a, a it can be a clientelist system where when I write a letter, I'm looking out for my students. When somebody helps my students, then I owe them favors, right? Like, so sometimes what your letter writer is doing is saying, "I'm by writing you a letter, they're kind of signaling, I'm willing to owe you a favor if you admit this student. Is That can be a subtext to this, right? So having a prestigious person that people want favors from isn't a bad thing. Okay. Your GRE scores, right? They're going to matter. Um, and... I would say like for when scores are optional, if your scores are in the top 10%, if you get in the 90th percentile and at least one, go ahead and submit the scores. Um, they're gonna help you. Uh, with math, right? Like the math GRE tends to be stuff you took early in high school or even in middle school. It's not actually super hard. Um, like the, And so time you spend studying since you're relearning stuff, not learning it for the first time, you actually can make significant improvements by studying actual content. Um, you are not going to improve your vocabulary in a meaningful way while studying for the GRE. Like your reading comprehension skills, they are what they are. Your vocabulary is what it is. So study test taking strategy, right? There's a way to get the right answer even when you don't know the answer. Like strategy is super important, but don't try to learn new verbal skills, I guess. Um, and similarly with writing, you're learning how to write to the rubric. Like it's a super specific skill to write a timed essay that is like mechanic that's graded uh, essentially mechanically. Um, so you want to really learn that rubric and how to write to it. But it's a you're learning how to strategize here. Um, so that's that's kind of the the GRE investments. The other thing, probably the most important thing about the GRE is that the GRE itself is a noisy assessment. If you take it twice, you won't get exactly the same score both times. So take it two or three times because you can report your highest score. So if we're taking, you know, draws from a noisy distribution, uh, we want to take multiple draws so we can take that, so then we can submit the best one. Um, all right. The writing sample, it's best if this is a research paper. Like if you have a publication, right, it's the publication. But um, so a research paper, like where you're creating new knowledge is best to kind of show, no, hey, I can do this. So you know, if you write an undergraduate honors thesis, it's probably going to be a, a sub a section of your honors thesis. Um, but if you don't have a research paper, that's okay. I wouldn't go out and try to write one from scratch to have that be your writing sample. I would take a, a long paper that you wrote as an undergrad and that you got an A on and polish that up, right? Um, so take a good paper, like whether you had a, if you had assigned a 10 page paper in a class, take that and polish it up, prove that you can write well. So it's best if you can prove you can write a research paper, but a lot of it is prove you can write well. I would say that for students who got their undergrad at American, at, at sort of at English language universities, I never look at the writing sample because that takes too much time to read a writing sample. When I'm doing like PhD admissions, I do not want to read writing samples. Um, I will really only look at it if somebody comes, they got their BA in a language other than English and I want to check their writing. Um, right, like at least early on. Maybe if I'm like haggling between two candidates right at the margin, maybe I'll go look at the writing samples. But it's not, 
at least for me, when I'm on a PhD admissions committee, it's not the first thing I look to. I look at GRE, I do that. I'm like, let, let me look at your GRE score. Let me look at whether you have research experience. Let me look at your research statement and see whether what you're doing, what you want to do sounds interesting and sounds like somebody who, who will do cool work. Um, I'll look at all those things before I would look at the right example. Um, all right. And then this is the last thing of me kind of talking at you. I figured I would put this in here, which is when you're kind of thinking about whether you want the PhD, some of it is like, does tenure track academia, does becoming a professor seem appealing at all? Like what, what is that stage of it? Um, so, okay, I've told you kind of what happens in a PhD program. If you get a tenure track job, what happens then? So you get hired and you're teaching your, you know, three or four, or eight classes a year, um, right? And, but you guys have kind of heard the adage like publish or perish, whether you get tenure. So tenure is an up or out thing. You're there for six years. And at the end of your sixth year, they give you an up or down decision where they either give you lifetime job security with much more job security than anybody should ever have. And it's really actually probably not productive. Um, or they fire you, right? It's up or out. It's not like you get denied tenure. So they give you a courtesy year. If you get denied tenure, they'll keep you on board for one more year where you look for another job. But when you get denied tenure, you're out. Um, so whether you get tenure or not, it's if you're if you're at a teaching focused institution, um, they'll really take your teaching evaluations and your mentorship record and that sort of stuff seriously. If you are at a research university, um, it's important that you don't have a bunch of like student complaints or something. But really, outside of that, being you know, there there's sort of the the cruel joke that like how do you predict who's not going to get tenure? Oh, it's the junior faculty member who won the teaching award because they're clearly spending too much time on their teaching and not doing their research, right? It's, it's publish or perish. And so getting tenure at, um, you know, getting tenure to top 10 department is like, they have to decide you're brilliant. Outside the top 10 or really outside the top five, if you have a solo authored book at a good university press and you've got three to six articles and a couple of them are very good art outlets and the others are okay outlets, like that's a good tenure file, right? And it's some mix of quantity and quality, you know, um, and and those kind of trade off against each other a little bit. Where if you if you you could have a book and two articles if the book is you know won a big award and the articles are both at the absolute top outlets and have tons of citations. Like you can you can have very little qu quantity if your quality is extremely high. Um, I think there's no amount of quantity that can trade off for the lack of quality, but there is a level of quality that can really uh, mean that you don't need a lot of quantity. Um, so there's kind of the book version of the tenure file in, at least this is in political science and in, in like an econ, it's just articles, right? And there it's really quality trades off for quantity where like, if you hit the top five, if you, if you get two papers in the top five, you're probably tenured. Um, but top five econ journals are exceptionally hard to publish in, um, in political science, it's that sole author book in a good, in a top 10 university press and three to six articles of which a couple of those should be in, in high prestige outlets. Um, but you can also in political science do a, an article based uh, file where you have 10 to 12 articles. And it kind of depends how much, how heavily co-authored is this stuff versus solo authored. There's a lot of like kind of trade-offs here, but this is kind of the broad strokes. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you have kids while you're on the tenure track, uh, that will, they'll give you an extra year on the clock. Um, at most places. So they'll give you like a semester off teaching while you, uh, for like parental leave, but then they'll also give, extend your tenure clock by one year. Um, I think that's most of the stuff I want to kind of do. And then at this point, I just want to shift to shift to Q and A. Um, Cause I think that's actually the, the useful way to spend our time here is talking about what you guys are curious about. I don't think I probably have to egg on this group too much, but everybody else wants the answers to your questions too, so. I have a question kind of about the research statement slash personal statement. So yeah. I went to, when I interned at the Fed, I went to one of their PhD panels. So this was all very econ heavy PhD students and they were very much like, you need to say that you want to work in the academy. Like don't say you want to work in the private sector would you also give that advice to a more social science minded person or that's, does it matter? That's a good question. So, and that's actually absolutely right. So the university is going to spend, yeah, like $350,000 training you. Why would they do that? Right? Like it's total loss. Like, so they're like, they're expending that much money to train a PhD student. Why do they want to train a PhD student? 
Well, what a unit the business model of university is that we don't really sell education, we sell prestige, right? Um, and so if if somebody gets their PhD at USC and then they get hired at some department and they go and they're successful in their field, uh, everybody's like, wow, what a great university USC is. They train such great researchers, right? So in some sense, when when a department is choosing to admit you and invest all these resources in you, it's for a couple of reasons. One, that you're going to be a brilliant research assistant for your faculty and you're going to help them publish. Like one of the best things about being faculty at a good university is you get to work with great doctoral students and that helps you publish, especially the older and more obsolete you get. You need these bright young students to uh, to do the most mentally challenging part of your research agenda. Um, so the faculty want to work with you as like a research assistant. So you should essentially like a lot of what SPAC is doing, right? Is, we're prepping you guys to be the most amazing research assistants for faculty when you get into a PhD program, right? And that helps you get into a good PhD program because faculty want amazing research assistants. But the university as a whole wants you to graduate with your PhD and go do things that universities think are prestigious. And we're super navel gazing. So what do we really think is prestigious? It's, oh, go be just like us. So if you go be tenured faculty somewhere else, that elevates our prestige. And that's what makes the university money in the long run. So telling the university that, or telling the admissions committee, I want to come here and I can't wait to do research with you. I'd love to do collaborative research with the faculty and I'm doing things that faculty are interested in. And when I graduate, I'm going to go get a tenure track job at a top research university and do super prestigious stuff. Um, like that's kind of the, the right answer um, in a sense for that. For that. Um, so you don't want to write things that aren't true, but you also um, maybe want to emphasize there may be six different uh uh, paths that would, um, there might be six different paths that are appealing to you post PhD. Like at the time you start, you might want to emphasize the ones that, that kind of align with the university incentives. So that's, that's a super good question. Um, and Haley had actually chatted something in about, the um, about the writing sample, right. Mm -hmm. And about whether you can use a co-authored writing sample or not. Um, and I would say, if you're going to do something co-authored, do two things, like do the co-authored piece and then something that you wrote just yourself. Um, but because it's so important, I think, to demonstrate the ability to do publishable research, like if you have a co-authored research paper, especially if you wrote some of it, I mean, I think that's the other thing is like, sometimes we're co-authors on stuff where we didn't write a lot of the prose, um, you know, where we did a bunch of the statistical analysis and we did the game theoretic model, but when it came to like writing up the prose in the paper, we didn't write much of that, right? And we might still be an author on that paper. Um, so it's something you wrote a lot of. You can put that in there and be like, well, actually, I'm the one who wrote this prose as well. Um, or you can do the co-authored thing and then also something that that you wrote yourself that's shorter, that's like, here's kind of my writing voice. I can write, but also, hey, look, I can do publishable research. Um, so you can have both things sort of stuck together as a single PDF in your writing sample. So let's say a writing sample of up to so many pages, it can be three different things or two different things. Um, um, I actually had a separate question. Thank you for that one. Um, I totally forgot that I chatted that during that time, but um, this might be radically different in social sciences compared to life sciences where you need to choose like someone's lab to be a part of, but to what extent does networking with potential advisors prior to applying play a role? I and think, how about approaching that? Yeah. So in a lot of the, the life sciences or in engineering, like your advisor is responsible for paying for you a lot. So like somebody, some individual in the faculty needs to be willing to make the financial leap. Um, and so it's super, super important. You kind of go in and you're so-and-so student in a much more locked in way. In the social sciences, the department is making the funding commitment to you. Um, and so you don't necessarily need to come in with a particular advisor. And many people come in without one. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you have someone who wants you to work with them and is looking forward to working with you, they can more, depending on their, depending on their clout within department politics, they can get you in if they really want you. Um, and so, uh, you know, like most faculty, if you email, if you cold email a faculty member and say, hey, can I meet with you because I'm applying to the PhD program? They're not super thrilled to make time for you. They're kind of like, wait until you get in and then talk to me. But, you know, you guys all have connections to me and probably to a number of other professors who will introduce you to somebody or whatever. Like if you can get their time and talk to them and get them excited about admitting you and working with you, 
they have the ability then to talk to the admissions committee and get you in. And I'll even say the way it works here at USC, I mean, this varies a lot from department to department, but like um, often, you know, often in the personal statement um, or in the research statement, people will list the faculty that they're excited to work with. And I do think this is smart. It shows that you know who's in the department, this kind of thing. But also you can accidentally shoot yourself in the foot when you're like, I want to come in and work with these two people who are already retired or who are, you know, and they're still on the website, but they're actually retired. Or these people, you know, so you want to make sure that the people you're listing to work with are actually people you could work with. Um, but uh, but they will, if somebody lists me in their personal statement or somewhere on their application as somebody they want to work with, what they do at admissions time is they send me the list of people who've listed me as somebody they want to work with. They say, what do you think of these four candidates or these six candidates? Um, and so even though I'm not on the committee. And if so, if somebody says, hey, I want to work with Ben and I want to work with, you know, Carol Wise, and then they ask Carol and they ask me what, the, what I think, and both of us are like, eh, I don't really want to work with that student. They're probably not going to admit that student. Right. So it is um, so it is very much to your advantage to have. I, I mean, it's a lot of work to figure out, like, who would my dissertation chair be at each of these 10 different freaking departments? And let me network my way in and talk to this person at 10 freaking different departments. However, to the extent you can do that at a few departments and have somebody who's there, who's excited to work with you and is willing to go to bat for you on a admissions committee, that's a really, really good way to get into a PhD program. Um, so it's a worthwhile investment to make it if you have the bandwidth and you guys, I think, I mean, A, you have me and John, you guys all have me and John and Megan, and most of you have some other faculty members as well who would make those sorts of introductions for you. Um, and you can also figure out who's uh, the director of graduate studies at the universities you're um, applying to and let your letter writers know who those directors of graduate studies are. Because, yeah, okay, I'm going to write you a formal letter of recommendation, but I may also send a three-sentence email to the to the director of graduate studies and just be like, hey, I've got a student who's a money-back guarantee, right? Um, like, you know, yeah, 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 I write student, I'll, I'll write letters for most people ask for them, but no, no, this student, like, admit this student, you will not regret it, right? Um, and so sometimes I'll send that three-sentence email, um, or one of your other faculty members may send that three-sentence email to either the faculty member you're thinking about working with or to the director of graduate studies. Um, Hello. Hey, hey, um, hey professor. I had a question about sort of like, it's a little specific to me, but for those of us, like I graduated in June and I was wondering like, once we choose to go into the private sector because that's what I chose. Yeah. Does that put you as a, at a disadvantage compared to someone that's straight out of undergrad? And also my other question is, what can I do with my free time to sort of improve my chances? Like, should I do like research on my own or, you know, stuff like that? Yeah, so, so A, I don't think so. No, I don't think you shoot yourself in the foot by going to the private sector. Um, and so one thing I'll say is particularly, and I should have sort of said this uh, on the letters of rec sort of section, but if you are, if you're thinking about applying in a couple of years, uh, get your letters now, right? Where you want to have somebody write your grad school letter of recommendation as close to the time they worked with you as possible, because their memory of you is only going to fade and their ability to write a good letter is going to fade. Um, and so you want to ask them for a letter and be like, hey, I'm not going to apply for a PhD for another couple of years but I'm pretty sure I want to do it. And I was hoping you'd write a letter that we can put on file so that when I do apply, that's ready to go. Um, and most of the folks who are willing to write you a letter are perfectly willing to write you a letter, but you know, so when I, you know, I went through undergrad and then did Peace Corps and then grad school, but I got my letters of rec before I left for the Peace Corps. Um, and then, and then they, you know, cause I can always take a, I can always take a letter that I wrote for you three years ago and add a couple, add a paragraph about what you've been up to since then. Um, but what, then is really detailed are all the anecdotes about the cool stuff you did when you were working with me in the lab, right? And like a good letter is a series of anecdotes, right? It's a story, right? It's not a string of adjectives. It's it's a string of stories is, is what makes a compelling letter. And, and people can't write those later. They can, you know, like they, they, you have to write that stuff when it's, when it's fresher. And also the letter rec request guide that I'll send around is mostly about teeing up your letter writers with those stories right? You provide the stories to them. You provide the examples of how you demonstrated all these great traits and skills. 
so that then their letter can be super concrete. And they and then they're even if their memory is a little faulty, you've really you've provided them that stuff. But you'll get better letters the closer to when you worked with them. So get your letters, go work in the private sector, develop some cool technical skills, and then have a story to tell about how the knowledge you learned working in the private sector is going to make you a great researcher in the academy. Um, but yeah, I, I most people who are admitted to PhD programs are not 22 year olds who just graduated in June, right? Like that's not actually the modal first year PhD student. A lot of, you know, half of the folks coming in have master's degrees. Most have been working for a couple of years. There's a few people who are coming straight through from undergrad, but usually that's not the bulk of the class. All right. Well, so there's a couple of different, and you guys, if, if questions percolate up as I continue to talk, we're not done with Q&A, but I'll, um, uh, so in two weeks, I think we already have it on the books that a couple of current PhD students are going to be available for a Q&A, um, which is a good time to talk about kind of some stuff about admission stuff, but also um, things about where you want to go to grad school, what type of programs, what to expect when you go, uh, what what you can do. Um, and actually, I should I realize that Andres, I didn't answer part of your question, which is what can you be doing with your spare time to make yourself more likely to be able to get into a PhD program? Um, and I mean, I think I think doing research is one of those things, right? Like, if to the extent you've got the bandwidth you know, working essentially as an unpaid research assistant with somebody on a, on a project, particularly one that might get you authorship, right, is is a really good idea, right? You have, in particular, you know, to, to speak directly to you, you have a strong technical toolkit and ability to do statistical computing, this kind of stuff, which means you can step into a lot of different types of ongoing papers and do jobs that, like, God, it would really be nice if we have somebody who could just crank away on the models and we can say, hey, can we try it this way? Hey, can we try it that way? Like having a research assistant who's able to do that is really valuable. Uh, a lot of times faculty members don't have grant money on for this and don't have that, you know. And so if you're able to step in and work for free on something, um, you know, let them know that, hey, I'd be very happy to do that. But look, if I if I do make contributions steadily throughout this project, I'd really appreciate authorship at the end. You know, you don't have to commit to that up front, but that's what I would really like out of this is, is one of those things, and it's not a crazy thing to ask for. Um, so A, I mean, doing that research work can help you because you get a strong letter of rec out of it and they talk about you. But B, it's not, you know, if you if you put, you know, if you were to put 100 hours of time, you know, over a few months into a research paper that somebody that then gets published, you know, if you're if you're cracking much over 100 hours on something and you're making a real intellectual contribution, there's sort of this, it's very fuzzy, right? But there's research assistant tasks where you're given a pretty well-defined task and you're doing exactly what you're asked to do, right? Um, and that's a research assistant. That's research assistant work. And what your PI kind of owes you is a nice acknowledgement in the acknowledgement section. Thank you so much to Andres for his wonderful research assistants, right? But then there's this thing where there are outstanding problems in the research that we haven't figured out how to solve. And you solve some of them or we're, you know, you come on really early in a project. We're still generating the theory here and you help contribute some of the theoretical ideas. You help design some of the, right. If you're making decisions about how the research is going to be done, if you're solving problems about make how to make it work, if you're designing the research, if you're writing the paper itself, if you're doing those things, you probably deserve authorship. Right. And so how much of those things exactly what's the boundary between a research assistant task and a co-author level contribution? That's fuzzy. Different people have different views of it. But I'll also say that that the. The contribution level that earns authorship is higher when you're not being paid. Right. If I'm paying somebody by the hour for everything they do, it's more likely I'm going to consider what they're doing. Uh, research assistant work and what I owe them is money and an acknowledgement. If I'm not paying them money, that threshold for me to flip them over and from the acknowledgement section into the author list, that threshold is going to be lower. Um,
I have a question and yeah. hello again. Hello. <laughs> Um, for students who like are interested in, like, yes, not immediately, but after like a year or two pursuing, like perhaps like a joint program, like a JD PhD, um, yep. I don't know how much insight you may have on like kind of preparing, like, I know it's like the different programs have different setups, like some you like get into one program and then you send a separate application for the other program that you want to add on. I don't know if like that kind of changes the timeline for certain things or like changes like yeah i mean i so i would say it's hard to get into top law schools and it's hard to get into top phd programs and so like make some applications to some of the joint programs you want jumping through their weird hoops about the joint applications but i would also think about which one you prefer to start first right because usually it's sort of like you'll do PhD coursework for two years and then you'll spend three years in law school and then you'll write your dissertation or like, you know, there's some sort of, or sometimes it's like, I'm going to do two years of law school and then two years of PhD and then the last year of law school. And then the, and then the dissertation, like think about like whichever one you would start first, whatever you do year one in first, get into a, you know, so if you're like, you know what, what I would start with is my one L year of law school. Okay. Get into a top law school. Right. And then when you're in a top law school, then apply to their PhD programs and then try to figure out how to make it work. And because also I'm not entirely convinced how much it's helpful to blend them together, right? Like there's just not a lot of overlap there. And so in some sense, you can get a JD and then a PhD or you can get a PhD and then a JD. Um, you know, I think most of the people who are coming into the academy so like the JD PhD is great for jobs at law schools. Obviously the private sector options are tremendous and all these great things. It's also uh, nice in, in um, a lot of our political science faculty actually have law degrees. Most of the folks that I know who, who are JD PhDs did and, and then are in the academy do JD and then PhD because you kind of want to be going straight from the research into your faculty position. Like the last thing you want to be doing is finishing up your, you want to finish up your dissertation last. And so there's, it's possible to kind of like toggle back and forth between taking law school classes and taking your doctoral class, your doctoral seminars and like kind of link those together. But the last thing you need to be doing is writing that dissertation. So it's not crazy to get a law degree and then get the PhD. Um, and most law school loans will pause while you're in a PhD program, but definitely like if you're going to do law degree and then PhD, make sure those loans will pause when you're in the PhD program, because otherwise that's going to undermine the whole financial architecture here. Um, and some of those, I don't know if any of those JD PhD programs give you essentially a tuition break on the law school part of it. If they do, that's super, super valuable because law degrees are freaking expensive. Um, which ends up being fine when you practice law, right? Less fine if like you go take a tenure track job in the political science department, which is a perfectly decent middle-class salary, but it's not corporate law and it doesn't pay back, you know, a quarter million dollars of law school loans very quickly. Um, <laughs> you know, probably don't have a quarter million, but you know, but law school loans do get hefty. They, well, they, they can get near that size. So um, yeah, depending on what you want to do with it, like law school salaries, Law school salaries, business school salaries are higher than political science departments, sociology departments, econ departments. And I would say salaries are sociology, political science, public policy, econ, and then and then law school, like that and, and business, law school and business school are then kind of up here. So that's kind of like the salary kind of tiering. Um, so if you've got, we do have a number of JD PhDs on the political science faculty here, and it's a great blending for doing social science research. Um, but a lot of those folks like actually got a law degree, practiced some, and then went back and got a PhD um, is actually for the people in my department. But like Abby Wood at our law school did like the JD PhD thing, um, but she got a JD at Harvard, got admitted to the Berkeley PhD program, got the PhD in Berkeley, and then went and taught in law schools. So um Right. Okay. So 
what's the best way to structure this for you guys, right? Where, so I have the, it is in my head that it would be, that the ability to exchange materials with people who are also applying is, is a valuable thing to get eyes on it. Um, I'm also like, I'm, I'm good for reviewing a material for each of you. So review your writing statement, uh, review your writing sample or review your personal statement or review, um, like I'm, I'm good to review a material or two for each of you. I probably can't do like multiple materials and multiple rounds, uh, across everybody. Like I'll just, I, I won't have enough time in my schedule, but I can do some directly myself, but there's a lot of eyes on each other's materials that you guys can do. Um, and then the other thing I can do is I can do more detailed sort of workshoppy sessions on individual materials, if that is helpful. Um, if you're like, no, I still just really don't even know how to approach the CV, or I still really don't know how to approach the personal statement. I will send some example statements around here. Uh, Jiwon shared hers, and I think one or two other students are going to be willing to share theirs. So I'll send those out um, in not too, you know, in the next couple of days here, I'll at least send out Jiwon's. Um, so thank you for providing that, Juwan. Um, uh, but yeah, what are, what is the most useful thing? Do you guys do you guys want structured sections on a session like Zoom sessions on a particular thing, or do you guys kind of want me just putting you guys in an email list and being like, hey, you guys should just you know email each other materials? How do we want to do this? I think for me, I would love a walkthrough on maybe the CB. That seems like the most helpful thing to like walk through the different sections that you could possibly have. And, you know, where do you put bullets? Where do you not put bullets? Those types of things. Yep. Um, but otherwise, I'm I feel like the email list approach, especially maybe if there was like a spreadsheet so we could see what types of programs other people are applying to, because I mean, I don't know if anybody else is applying in life sciences, but like seeing similar materials there would be really helpful for me and having somebody with that background would be really helpful, but I don't know what everybody else's background on these calls are. So um, that would be great personally. I, on that note, I was gonna say, I think it would be really useful to, yeah, to have a spreadsheet, but also sort of like, have a space for like what are your research interests or like what things you would like to focus on so that way if you if there's someone that's applying to similar programs or you want to learn more about a certain you know focus that someone has you can contact that person and, and talk to them do people like a slack channel or is slack obnoxious i can start a slack channel for people doing this and where we can drop materials and and that sort of thing or do we just want a spreadsheet and do this by email i think an email or a slack channel might be helpful for something like studying for the gre um i've been doing like two hours of studying a day because i kind of decided to do this a little bit last minute um and i'm also applying for a master's so it's not like as involved as a phd so like mad respect to all of you who are doing that um but like i was like browsing like a subreddit on the GRE and I actually found like a program you can subscribe to for like I think it's like six dollars a month or something that has like a set out study plan and like lecture videos that are teaching you kind of these fundamentals and the strategies of like how to approach the problems um, that I've been doing and I personally found it really helpful so like it might a slack channel or email might be really helpful to just for people to, like share kind of tips and tricks about that kind of thing um yeah yeah is there anybody who's like, wait, if this is on Slack, I'm not getting on Slack. That's just not an accessible platform for me. I hate that because that's a totally fair position to take, by the way. Okay, then we're going to set up a Slack channel for this. That will kind of get people in conversation. We'll try to make the spreadsheet as well. I mean, I think the spreadsheet is is not redundant to that, to like kind of summarize the information. Um, okay. Great. So spreadsheet, Slack channel, session on CVs. Give me a little wave if you would like a session on CVs. Okay. All right. Yep. Good. I will do a session on CVs. Um, excellent. Well, this is good. Um, then I think actually, you know what? Let's take 
this time because like it's all fine and good if if I put somebody's name in a spreadsheet with what they're doing and we can sort of look through that but we are all all of you you know and, and there will be some additional people who weren't here today we'll, we'll get them on the spreadsheet but can we go around with the folks who are here and say hey who you are <laughs> where are you now what kind of PhD programs are you planning to apply to or anything else that you're willing to to put forward to the group um because I think like just kind of getting a sense of who else is in this pool because most of you, I'm guessing, know like three other people on this call is probably two to three other people is probably the modal number of, of who knows uh, who. So, um, and Marie, can I put you on the spot to uh, to kick us off here? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everybody. My name is Marie Zaragoza. I graduated from USC back in December of 22, so almost a year now. Um, I'm currently working in government consulting, but I have my eye on a PhD maybe in the future. I'm really interested in international political economy from the social science, political science side, rather than the more quantitative econ side of things. Um, so I'm here for general knowledge gathering, but would love to, oops, I'm also not to answer a bunch of, oh, cool. me. Uh, hey, Abby. Hi, nice to see you again, Professor Graham and everyone. I'm Abby. I'm a senior at Tufts in Boston, and I worked in the spec lab last summer um, under Professor Graham's Everyday Respect Project, which is super eye-opening and very enriching to learn about. And um, I study sociology and international relations and very interested in um, kind of like urban issues, dealing with inequality as well as like housing um, disparities and like economic justice, as well as healthcare. So um, I came to this call to kind of like keep my eye on, I don't know, like information and knowledge about grad school and PhDs. Um, and so, yeah, thinking about like applying to grad school, but then like probably next year, like dual degrees, as Liz was mentioning as well, um, and keeping my eye open to PhD programs in the future. Yeah, hey. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ben, for holding this session. My name is Yaha Lee, and I'm currently based in Vancouver. So I studied international relations and economics in my undergrad, and then I went on to do my master's in public policy and global affairs. And right now, I've been working for about two years. I'm doing consulting at the World Bank. Uh, I previously worked as a policy specialist at Huawei, and I'm also partnered with a local consulting firm. And so I really enjoy what I'm doing, but I would like to pursue further studies in order to sort of bring it up to the next level. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and hear from your wonderful presentation, Ben, and I'm looking forward to, yeah, working through the process with everyone. Thanks, Zaha. Uh, Zaha. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm using a new laptop, so. Just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I'm Zara. I'm currently based in New Haven, Connecticut, because I'm working as a research assistant here at Yale um, School of Management. Um, in undergrad, I studied business and economics. Um, I'm planning to apply to this coming cycle to a mixture of poli sci, public policy, and business schools. I have a very wide range of interests, as you can tell. Um, I'm planning to, my research interests right now involve like political economy and development and also like quant methods. And and yeah, and I'm currently also studying for the GRE. So a Slack channel for a GRE prep would be super helpful for me. And um, yeah, so thank you also, Ben, for organizing this. Super, super helpful. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Haley. Yeah, um, I'm Haley Robertson. I graduated in May 2021 with a degree in global health and geospatial intelligence. Um, I am currently working as a researcher and data engineer at Georgetown University in uh, like their Center for Global Health Science and Security, um, and formerly was at Talus Analytics, which was a consulting firm focused on global health data analytics. Um, my research interests are in like quantitative disease ecology. Um, so very different from like the spec labs research. Um, but I would say like, I have a very policy heavy focus in that um, and like interdisciplinary lens to it, the impact of policy on like infectious disease basically. 
but am applying this year to a mix of like ecology, biology, and like maybe epidemiology programs, depending on where disease ecology is housed. Cool. Um, Megan. Uh, hi, my name is Megan Bennett. I am uh, graduated from USC in 20, spring 2021 um, with a degree in international relations, economics, and French. Um, I am currently working in economic consulting here in LA um, in an office downtown. Um, so like I said before, I'm just applying for a master's, not a PhD, um, but Dr. Graham was kind enough to add me to this just because there's definitely a lot of overlap with um, personal statements, uh, GRE, rec letters, whatnot. Um, and I'm applying for a master's in business analytics um, because I'm trying to work transition more to like data science kind of stuff. I do a lot of data analysis right now. Um, and I kind of, instead of going for like a master's in data science, um, I wanted to do business analytics because it's basically a data science degree in a business school, um, especially depending on like how you plan it. So I kind of like having both like building all my technical skills, but also kind of getting like the credentials of like, oh, I went to a business school and stuff. Um, so that's kind of my overall goal with that. Nice. Uh, Robert. Hello, everyone. I'm Robert. I'm senior studying economics and data science at USC. So this is my last year here. Um, I'm currently applying to some research assistant positions, and I'm also um planning to to apply to some um econ and PhD econ or business PhD programs in this upcoming cycles. Um, I'm interested in specifically, I would say, um environmental policy and its connection with like the broader economy so yeah great uh andres hello everyone uh, my name is andres i recently graduated from ucsd um, in political science and data analytics i'm currently working at sony pictures uh i work in the info seg department mainly with sort of like behavioral data and so I, I work as a data analyst and I sort of analyze a lot of the data that we have. And my interests are, initially it was sort of like political methods, but now I think I'm more interested in sort of like cognitive science or like how political behavior affects, um, sorry, sorry, political culture affects political behavior. So that's why I'm like sort of thinking about either doing a poli-sci program or maybe cognitive science or data science. So I'm sort of like picking which one fits what I want to do best. Nice. Uh, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm currently a senior at UNC Chapel Hill, but I'm from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, yeah, I'm majoring in political science and global studies with a minor in creative writing. And my interests are largely focused on like East Asiatic politics, especially like how um, economic interactions with like um, West Africa. And so I'm interested in pursuing a PhD program after taking two years to like probably work and applying to fellowships right now as well. But yeah, I'm still like trying to do most of the work now to prepare myself for that, but yeah. That's wise. Yeah, GRE is not a bad thing to take, like when you're fresh out of undergrad too, because um, I don't think it's it the goal. really applies, uh, really improves over time either. <laughs> and G1, do you want to say hey? Hi everyone, my name is Jiwon and I am a third year PhD student here at USC. And I'm not applying PhD program again, but I <laughs> It was very difficult for me to apply during the pandemic uh, period. And um, I thought it would be really helpful, helpful for me to see how Ben provides information session for his students, because uh, I'm expecting to be in uh, to be asked to be in charge of this kind of event when I go back to my home country. And Ben is always a good, good professor and mentor for me. So thank you so much for um, having me and 
being a great, great mentor for me. <laughs> and thank you for being willing to share your statement. Um, that's going to be really helpful. Uh, so I appreciate your willingness to put yourself out there and to, and to support everybody here because that's the nice thing about our current PhD students. They're all recently successful uh, doctoral program applicants. Um, and actually, Gabriel, do you want to like poke your head in the camera and say hey to folks? Um, Gabriel's been hanging out in my office in the office. Hello, He's um, <laughs> got the live version. <laughs> Uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm a junior. I'm studying economics and mathematics at USC, um, and I'm hoping to begin the whole application cycle next year. So trying to get a little bit ahead because it's a long process. All right. Excellent. Well, that gives folks a little bit of a sense of kind of who we all are here. Um, and then, like I said, I think there's probably half a dozen other folks who may kind of loosely be part of this group who, who weren't able to be here today. So we'll get a Slack channel going, we'll get the, the spreadsheet going, kind of ask people to, to populate their own uh, information in that. Um, so you should be hearing um, either from Elijah or from Gabriel or, or, or somebody kind of with, with details going forward. Don't be shy about pinging me directly for ways we can do this different or better or more. Um, and yeah, it's it's fun for me to see all your faces too. This is the great, this is the great thing about uh, doing this. I get to kind of check in with them. Some of you guys I haven't heard from as much. So um, it's wonderful to see you all and happy Friday. All right, wait, I just remembered a question I had. If I, I don't want to like put everyone up. Like, yeah, I should ask that. Yeah, if there's anybody else who has them, we can do more too. But yeah, what's up, Megan? Yeah, so I am um, I was considering applying to um, UC Berkeley's MSBA and like, I don't think I'm unqualified, but it's also like a very hard school to get into. So I'm kind of like, eh, probably not, but like might as well. Um, and the thing is, is that they require one more rec letter than all, like I'd have to get an additional rec letter that like none of the other programs I'm applying to require. Um, and then also like the prerequisites are a little bit confusing because like, they're like, oh, we want you to have um, linear algebra and calculus one, but like, you know, you'll be a stronger candidate if you already have them done, but like, you know, you can always take them in like the spring semester or whatever. And it's just kind of confusing. I'm just like worried, like I never took linear algebra and for some reason USC waived my Calc 1 requirement because of Calc AB from high school. And I don't remember why or if they ever told me. Um, so like my prerequisites are like a little bit weird and I'm kind of just like not sure if it's worth going through that extra effort because I'm a little bit like hesitant whether or not they would care because I know like some like I'd email UCLA about a similar thing they're like as long as you took at least one math class you'll be a great candidate and I was like oh that's not what your website says um yeah. so I'm kind so of that, like that disconnect is not yeah. that uncommon but is frustrating <laughs> and I would say like they don't yeah. care AB probably USC waived calc one because it overlaps in content completely with AB calc from high school so like so so I would just assert. Yeah, I think AB is like one semester or like half of Calc one, so it's like uh, weird. But I yeah. never, I never struggled in any of the econ classes that required Calc one, so I'm kind of like I don't think it I would matters. Just assert but like, that you have the calculus, assert that you have the calculus, yeah. and say that you're planning to take the linear algebra, and then if you get in, okay. make it. So just say you know. So say that you're planning to take okay. linear algebra before you arrive, you can like find whatever linear algebra program you would do, you know, where you take an online uh -huh. linear algebra or something, find a plausible one. Right. So if I get in, I'll take uh -huh. it. Then if you get in, ask them if you really have to before you show up. And <laughs> but you know, yeah. have to place you yeah. understand planning to do a plan yeah. and you know, and ask for the extra letter. Because that's not uh -huh. I mean, it's work for your advisor, but it's not that much work for you. Um, so you know, if you need that letter from me, or if you need that letter from somebody else, right, like get 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 the other letter yeah. and just do it yeah because I feel like I have like pretty like a pretty strong GPA from like undergrad and like my my job that I do right now it's like almost entirely statistical programming and like all of that so like I feel like everything else I feel like is like pretty strong it's just like one class or one and a half classes I guess so I wouldn't I yeah wouldn't stress that part I would just assert. Okay, cool. I'm the type of person where if I'm not checking every single box, I'm like, ah, oh, I shouldn't apply. But I know that's not how it works. So, yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> All right. Anything else percolate up for anybody else that we want to chat about before we wrap? Uh, yeah, I just want to ask a quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you want your kind of research that you're going into within these programs to kind of align with stuff that's already being kind of researched within the university. Um, like how important do you think, or to what extent do you think 
that's important, like kind of in the application. I, 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 so I, I wouldn't worry about it aligning with the department in particular. It's just mm -hmm. unless it's a really weird niche thing. Like if you're doing okay. something fairly mainstream, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to say, well, all I really care about and what I am a thousand percent sure I want to do is this super niche thing. And they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, why do you want to come here then? Right. Like yeah. you're doing something fairly mainstream. Don't stress it. Like there's mm -hmm. going to be somebody in the faculty who has some expertise there. Um, yeah. And like I said, a lot of this is like, I mean, my my approach was literally I applied to all top 10 programs in the U.S. News and World Report. And I was just mm -hmm. like, that was my list. Right. Like, you know, so it wasn't like some precise matching. Like it's it's only like. I think you get in trouble when you articulate like something or like a, a topic where you're like, okay, I can see somebody being really passionate about that, but you can't possibly publish and get a job doing that. So we don't want mm -hmm. to like, so it's okay. more, um, you want to be proposing something where the committee looks at it and says, yeah, somebody with those interests who does a dissertation that sort of roughly builds in that direction is fairly likely to be successful in our department and in the field. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, then I will see you guys all in two weeks. In two weeks, we'll kind of do a Zoom like this with grad students and we'll do, um, we'll, we'll start to do more of the ad hoc and then we'll schedule the CV session at some point and we'll get the Slack and the, and the spreadsheet going. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. It was good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let me show this.